is also you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Your fight is also your fuel. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, it's also your fuel. <laughs> In fact, you're so good. While he's working this thing as well, he knows how to turn it around. It, it looked like it was going to hurt you, but God's going to use it to help you in Jesus' mighty name. Anybody excited about that? Amen, 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 amen. Now, now we're going to get into that word in a second, but before we go there, last week we talked about no more delays. Amen? And just to remind you, unfortunately we couldn't put it out, the load shedding messed us up and we'll have to do a re-recording, but just to recap for those of you who weren't there very quickly, we only spoke about three things. Before we talked about no more delays, we had to say there's no more deceptions. I'm missing my keyboard, it's, where are you, where are you my friend? Help me, help me. There are no more deceptions, amen? Because part of the reason is that some of the reason for your delay is because some of us are following deceptions. That, that you're following things that God never said over your life. And it's wasting, it's wasting your time and your day. And part of what he needs to do is to remove deception from your life. Because you're chasing it with energy, but you're going the wrong way. Amen? So say no more deception. <laughs> then we talked about no more doubts. God said, I will do what I say. I'm going to do it. But it, it, the, we want the discernment to know what did he say and what did he not say. The thing that he said is going to fulfill it, shout amen. amen. And then he said, and I will do it without delay. So he said, some of you are going to think this is something for years from me about. Some of you, your answer is coming in a few days. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't think anybody's excited about that because the, the disbelief has to be broken in the house of God. Amen. Some of you, the miracle is coming in just a few months. Hallelujah. You've been praying for a long time. May the Lord bring it before the end of the year. Amen. And for some of you, we talked about our theme for next year is one word. What is it? Come on, shout it out. What is it? Come on, shout it with some faith. What is it? How many of you need a miracle? Shout miracles high. That's our theme from January to December. Not as just Bromfontein. It's every nation Rosebank, every nation Vince, every nation DFC, every nation Durban, every nation Cape Town, wherever you find an every nation in this world. There's 200 nations, we are in 70 of those nations. There's hundreds and hundreds of churches and all those people have believed that the Lord is saying one word for us as a church. What is that word? Yeah. Now, don't you know there's thousands of people praying in one direction? Do you think God is not gonna answer that prayer? I came to tell you your miracle is on the way, hallelujah. Oh, I need to work on some faith in the house, amen? Hallelujah. We are going to stand on that thing from now till December. And I pray when I see you this time next year, you and I will not be the same in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout no more delays. No more delays. That was last week. This message is connected to that. We're in Ezekiel 39 from 9 and 10. Ezekiel 39, verse 9 and 10. And the title again, I tell you, is your fight is also your fuel. Father, would you grace me as I get into this word? In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And I thank you for what you're about to do. Give me my scripture, my pastor. Ezekiel 39, verse 9. Ah. Then those who live in the towns of Israel been through things, but I pray these next seven years, they will lose them for fuel continue. They will not need to get these things that are, that are breaking my heart. They're going to use those weapons. I don't know what weapon has been against your life. I don't know what weapon has attacked you. I don't know what weapon attacked your family. I don't know what generational weapons you face. I don't know what you face in your relationships. But God says that weapon will be used for fuel. And they will plunder those who plundered them. Now that's a verse. That is a verse I could sit on the whole day, amen? Anybody ready to plunder those who tried to plunder them, amen? amen? Oh, Lord, help us today. And they will, not 
not shall, not might, not they're thinking about what it might happen. They will plunder those who plundered them and loot, that means rob. Those who try to rob, remember the enemy comes to steal, to kill and to? He came at you, oh, but you're gonna get him back, amen? Oh, just say to the devil, I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I don't know where he is in your life. He might be under your bed or waiting for you at all. Just say, I'm not done yet. Amen? He tried to steal your joy. He tried to steal your confidence. He tried to steal your self-esteem. He tried to steal your job. But it doesn't matter what he stole from you. He says, they, they will loot those that came to loot them. Declares the sovereign Lord. God says, I said it. And if I said it, that settles it. Hallelujah. Any plunderers in the house today? Any warriors in the house today? Anybody ready for a fight today? Amen, amen. I hope you're ready. Amen. Where is my water? Just help me out, somebody, If you could just help me out, please. Very good. Praise the Lord, amen. Come on. So, are you all ready for me? Bring appetizer. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 <laughs> you can bring water for nothing but me. <laughs> bring me some appetizer. Amen. And the Bible said that those who give water to a righteous man, you shall not lose your reward. Amen. Whatever you're going to sow into the house, you will not lose your reward. Amen. Whether it's a fanta, whether it's a water, may we come and enjoy it together. Amen. Amen. Now let's get going. Now, a couple of years ago, Pastor T.D. Jakes was in town, and you know I love T.D. Jakes, so I was around. And he was at Rayma, and he was preaching a message. And he preached a message very similar to my title today. He called his message, your battle is your bread. Your battle is also your bread. Amen? And, and what he was trying to point at is that there, there are battles that you face in life. But those battles, inside those battles, there's something in the battle that is nourishment for you. There's something in the battle that will also feed you. There's something in the battle that has nutrients for you to make you stronger. It's hard to do the fight, but if you battle it out, your battle is also your bread. Love the message, amen? And then he spoke about the, 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 the story he was telling was when they, the, the Israelites came to the promised land. Remember those 12 spies that went out. From those 12 spies that went out, 10 of them came back. And here's what they said. He said, the land is good. Oh, Lord. The promised land is good. There's grapes this big. Amen. It's like, it's like when we go to Uganda or to Lepopo and we see mangoes this big. Amen. That's the promised land for somebody. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He said, the grapes are this large, but there's giants in the land. Because you know, whenever there's a blessing, there's also a battle, amen? He said there's, there's promise, but there's also a battle. And here's what they said. They said, the challenges are too much for us. And they said, because it's hard, they looked at the giants and they saw themselves as grasshoppers. They, they saw themselves small as they looked at an enemy that looked too big. But Joshua and Caleb were completely different. Joshua and Caleb saw the same thing. How is it that all of us can see the same thing but see it differently? They saw the same giants, the same problem, the same economy in our country, the same problems we are facing in the city, but some of them saw it with faith and some of it saw it with fear. So they saw the same giants, but Caleb and Joshua said this. They said, these guys, because they looked, they looked at not the giant, but they saw their big God. They saw their almighty God. As they looked at their almighty God and they looked down, they said, ah, what's this thing is smaller than my God. And here was what they said. They said, because God is big and we belong to him, these enemies, they shall be our food. <laughs> he said, we are going to eat them up. It's almost like that phrase where they said, this is breakfast food for champions, amen? They said, listen, it doesn't matter us, heroes. We are going to eat this challenge. Look at the difference. The one saw the big giant and saw themselves as a small grasshopper. The one saw their big God. You know this message. And then in the midst of that, they said, that enemy, ah, 
it's my food. That was his message, and I'll come back to that. Now, in the midst of that, that is the kind of mentality you have to catch this morning. This morning, and I love how my sister was saying it, we are looking for soldiers this morning. I love, she was, she was busy preaching here, she was about to take off her heels and start looking for boots and kick something, it was awesome, amen? I was so ready to find a spear and something to fight with you, amen? Like, I love it, I love it, seeing a woman with boots ready to fight, it's a blessing, amen? amen? She was ready to fight because right now, in this season, God is looking for soldiers. You are going to have to fight. This thing is not going to come to you on a silver platter. Even if he gave you the promised land, he said, you have to go possess it. He said, there's a giant in that land, and if you really want it, you better be ready to go fight for it. But if you're going to sit down and just expect, ah, it's going to come to me, it's not coming. So I'm looking for warriors this morning. Hallelujah. Any warriors in this house? Okay, I feel like we're starting now, amen? Now, there's this concept, before I even get to the text, I want to work something here. There's this concept in the body of Christ where, in fact, let me say it like this. When we think of the church, we'll think of the church in different ways. We'll think of the church as sometimes we think of the church as family. And that's what we are. You're my brother, you're my sister, he is our father, we are family. Amen? And sometimes we look at the church and we look at the church as, as the body. Because the church is the physical body of the invisible God. So when God wants to touch the city, he's not going to just come and show up and touch the city. He's going to do it through you. Because you are the hands of Jesus, amen? You are the feet of Jesus. So while we are crying for politics, God is going to use his body to enter into that realm and change something, amen? amen. We are the body of Christ. Or we might look at the, at the church as, as a building. It is this building. That, or even the, we might look at it as the bride of Christ. There's this relationship, your, your picture of Christianity is like a, a husband that loves his wife. It is intimacy. It is worship. It is private. It is things you can only say to God that you can't say to anybody else. Just say, I love him. <laughs> Just in the bottom of your heart, just say, I love you, Jesus. Amen. He calls us, he says, you're my bride and I love you. There's private things I can do and say with you that I don't share with anybody else. If, if you think that ha, we, have, we have an idea as far as marriage is concerned these days that marriage is not supposed to be exclusive. We have these open marriages. The devil is a liar. Praise the Lord. Amen. Marriage is meant to be exclusive and God wants to have an exclusive relationship with you. We are the bride of Christ. Amen. As beautiful as all those things are, the one we hardly ever speak about is the picture of the church as an army. Yeah. <laughs> as soldiers, amen? And we hardly ever, and I'm beginning to love the idea of the church as an army because an army understands that we've got a mission. An army understands that we've got a fight ahead of us. An army understands that our fight is not for our personal pleasures. We are fighting for the souls of human beings. Amen? We are fighting for life and death situations. That the things that we are preaching, they save lives. And the enemy has caught some people captive. An army understands that sometimes you're going to get hit by with bullets, but we keep on going. Amen? Amen. That, that's, what a, that's the mentality of a soldier. Sacrifice. And so, of course, it's still family because I can tell you now, who would you rather stand with? Just, you know, somebody in your family, you don't want to speak against your family or anything like that? Or somebody who's ready to take a bullet for you? Hallelujah. Because some of us know even in our families, somebody may not be willing to take a bullet. And even you, before we start judging them, <laughs> There are some family members that you would think twice if the gun came out, you'd be like, hey, <laughs> ah, Lord. <laughs> hey, man, you'd have, you'd, you'd have to jump in front, but you jump kind of dodging there. Like. <laughs> Amen? But soldiers create, they, they develop such a camaraderie, such a tight bond. Because I was fighting and it hit me and I fell down and you didn't run away, you came back and you picked me up. You put me on your shoulder and you, you kept running with me when I could not run myself. How would I not fight for you for the rest of my life? How would I not give my 
myself to you for the rest of my life. You didn't let me go. There's people in this church that you think, like, life is tough and life is hard, but we are not going to let you go. We shall pick you up when we need to pick you up. We shall keep on running. I think my sister even said that. We are, we are soldiers. We are not just family. I want, I need to know that if the enemy walks in here, you're not running away. You're standing with me. Anybody standing with me this morning? Yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now some of those who are still thinking, are like, well, Pastor, I don't know you that well, but you know, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Amen? Soldiers, I'm going somewhere, don't worry about it. Soldiers, army. That's the kind of idea as we're getting into this text. One last thing I'll say very quickly. In fact, chapter 37, oh, I'll go there just now. There is a philosopher that said this. He said, in an army of about 100 people, in every army, if there's about 100 people, in of those 100 people, about 10 of those people shouldn't even be there. <laughs> I wonder if you're in that 10. <laughs> when it comes to the fight, around 10 of those people shouldn't even be there. Around 80 of those people, 80 of them are just moving targets. They just, they're just sitting in the seats. Hmm. Lord. Around nine of those in that hundred are the fighters. He said only a few of them in that army are the real fighters. And he said those nine make the battle. Even in a church like this, it's so sad for me to say it, but there's only about nine people in this church that hold this church up. No. That if those nine were to leave right now, you would feel it. Yeah. But if somebody in those 80 disappeared, I feel bad to tell you this, but can I just tell you the truth, amen? Yeah. Because there, there's some people who all you're doing is sitting in the seat. You're, you're, you're like, oh, they're doing this, they're doing that, but they don't know the God who's inside of me. I don't hear you say, greater is he that is in me than him that is in the world. I'm, I'm looking for the nine fighters. Yes. Fighters, he said. There's, there's about nine of you, I love you so much, I'm not even going to try to point out. But if they left, if you are a warrior, there's going to be a war. If you are a conqueror, there's going to be something you have to conquer, child of God. We don't just say these things and then just sit down and say, oh, it's going to be great. We have a fight in front of us. And if you're not ready to fight, you may lose everything that God has for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, your fight is not to destroy you. Your fight is your fuel. It's your fuel. It's your fuel. It, it's not happening to you, it's happening for you. <laughs> the, the thing you're facing is, it's not here to destroy you, it's, it's here to develop you. There's something God is building in the fight that you're fighting right now. I, this message, there's a prophetic edge to it because God wants to speak to something that you're fighting with right now. God wants to speak to something that you're complaining about, something that is confusing you, something that is weighing you down, and he's trying to tell you that thing that you're crying about, your fight, is actually your fuel. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now with that in mind, let's go back to this text. So, in chapter 38 and 39, God starts to speak about a great battle. And as we get into this battle, he, he's about to, he's already going to defeat them. And I'll get back to that. Before we get to 38 and 39, from 37, he, he talked about this army. And then he goes to 38 and 39 and talks about this battle. And he speaks of Gog and Magog. How I don't have time to talk to you about Gog and Magog. Some of you have never heard that name before. It's okay. You don't have to worry about God. Some of you are is that Gogo -go and Magogo? -go? No, it's not. <laughs> it better not be. It's God and Magog. Some of it, God shows up in Genesis. He shows up in Ezekiel. And he shows up in Revelation. Because some of this is an end times prophecy. He's not speaking about one particular battle. He's speaking about an enemy. He's, it's, it's the culmination of all 
the things that come against God. It's, it's the Antichrist. It's the combination of every enemy that is against the things of God. And he's saying, I am going to defeat that enemy. I have already defeated that enemy. By the time we get to this verse, he's telling the people of Israel, God and Magog are going to rise up. He tells them in Revelation, this enemy is going to rise up. But if you've ever read the book of Revelation, text, knowing that the battle has already been won. I want you to go in what we're about to process. And in the, in the week you're about to face and the, the things that you're about to go through, I want you to go in remembering that the devil has already been defeated. Amen. That's how we fight as warriors in the kingdom of God. Amen? At the end of the day, Jesus wins. Somebody shout amen. amen. And if you are in Jesus, guess what? You win! Yeah. Champions of the house of the Lord. Amen? I already know the end of the story. It's like when you've watched a movie and you've already seen it. Have you ever watched a soccer match and you, you, already, you already saw the ending? You already know what's going to happen. So in the middle, you don't get scared. You actually get excited. You're like, they're down, but somebody said they're going to win. It must mean a miracle happened before the end. Does that make sense? If you're facing something right now and it looks like the end, it must mean a miracle happens before the end of the game. So don't lose your faith. Remember that God has already defeated that enemy. Amen? Amen. Now let's go into it. So when he goes inside, <laughs> here's what he says to them. Because I've defeated the enemy, give me verse 9. He says, I want you to go in and I want you to take the weapons hmm, and use them for fuel. Here is the the basis of today's message. This message is about, about how do I turn my pain into power? How do I turn my wounds into wisdom? How? How, how do I turn the things they ever show us this morning? Amen? How do we take the weapons that were formed against you and turn them into fuel for your fire and for your future? How? And I'll be out of your way. One, you have to take hold of the weapon. Two, you have to transform that weapon. Three, you have to triumph with that weapon. Amen? You've got to take it, you've got to transform it, and you've got to triumph with it. Are you ready for the rest of this word? Yeah. Okay, so let's go. He says, go get it. That thing that came to hit you, the spear, the shield, the arrow, he says, go get that weapon. Take hold of it. You're going to turn it into fire. What am I trying to tell you? You're going to have to phrase it differently. You're going to have to face it. You're going to have to face it. The thing that hits you, the thing that hurts you, you you're not going to win by denying it. You're not going to be winning by thinking, by acting like you're fine, and you're not fine. Amen. Sister, you're not fine. Amen. Ah, I feel something for somebody. Amen. You're not okay. Amen. It's not okay. And coming to church and just singing and dancing and, and not talking to anybody, uh, uh, my, my, my mother calls it, and she said, she said, a lot of people come to the church, they're wearing their makeup. And she said, Pastor, it was so funny for me because I realized even the pastors are wearing makeup. I said, ah. <laughs> I said, Mama, you, you, can't, you can't show everybody everything. Amen. Amen? Amen. But you better show somebody. Somebody better know it's not okay. It's not okay. So, somebody here, you're facing something. And it's hard. And God is saying, I don't want you to deny it. I preached a message a long time ago, and I talked to you that, um, that, that faith is not about denying. I took the message was called Face the Facts. Do you remember that message? It, it said, faith doesn't deny the fact. It, it faces it. And it believes God in the midst of the facts. Amen? That Abraham knew that his body could not produce. He didn't deny it. He said, I'm barren, but I believe God. Amen? 
You've got to take hold of it. You've got to face it. What happened to you as a kid? You've got to face it. What happened to you in a church? You've got to face it. What happened to you with somebody you trusted? You've got to face it. Not just face it, you've got to feel it. You've got to feel that thing. Because you can't get real healing without real feeling. You, you can't. Sometimes people come and then they act like they're healed. And that thing is burning on the inside. It's boiling on the inside. It's, it's acid on the inside. And they keep on going, keep on going, until somewhere down the line they blow up. And they don't even know why they're blowing up because they think that they're fine. And it's because they, something happened and they said, no, I still gotta go to work, I need to. So they just pushed it away and they don't get to feel. You're not fine, my friend. You're not fine. And it's okay to say that. <laughs> God is not angry. Just because we say more than a conqueror, that doesn't mean we don't face things. Go to that text. He says, in these troubles, I am more than a conqueror. Amen. He's not denying the trouble. He's like, in these things, he says, I am pressed, but I'm not crushed. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I'm struck down, but I'm not abandoned. He said, I'm facing stuff, but it's not killing me. But he doesn't deny it. You've got to face it. You've got to feel it. You've got to accept yourself. You've got to accept your mind. Part of your healing is accepting the role you played in your suffering. Amen. Part of you getting well is accept. You can't just be blaming mama, papa, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, friend. You can't just be a lecturer, money. Part of your healing is accepting the role you played Amen. in the suffering you're facing. Amen. You're facing some things and you did it. And when you give your confession, even to the pastor, you 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 give the the polished story. <laughs> you give the the edited version. Amen. Yeah? Amen. <laughs> you say, hey, this happened. Amen. But you don't tell us how you went there. <laughs> and how you SMS and how you WhatsApp and how you what but you only come right, like, this happened. Yeah. And I, I don't because we don't want to get in the detail, we don't ask too many questions. <laughs> Because <laughs> maybe we shouldn't ask too many questions, but you Hallelujah. and your God Amen. have to spend time in that moment and say, Amen. here's what I did to contribute to what I'm suffering. Because you're not going to go forward and say, no more delays. Amen. You're, not, you're delaying your life by not facing the truth. You're delaying your future by not facing what you are doing Amen. that's slowing you down. Amen. Why do you keep going back to him? Amen. That's for somebody you don't have to say amen. Mm. Mm. amen. You just have to think about it if that was you. Amen. Why do you keep using your money the way you use your money? Yeah. Why? What? What? Yeah, yeah. Life is hard. Life is hard. It's true. But, but what are you doing? He says, the weapon, you've got to go and take hold of it. Before we transform it, we have to take hold of it. And we have to recognize, what is this thing here? What is it that's been trying to kill me? Am I making sense this morning? Right. So number one, you're going to take hold of it. Then number two, you have to take that thing and you have to transform it. You have to change your, your, your perspective of this thing that is hitting you. You have to sit in God and let God transform it for your good. He takes the weapon and he turns it into fire. That means he's turning it into fire so that he can be cooking food in the weapon that tried to kill him yesterday. He's busy cooking. He's like, yesterday they tried to kill me. Today I'm busy cooking my chicken and my lamb with all of these things that they tried to hurt. He used what hurt him he transformed it into something that can help him. How many of you know, uh, if you're singing that song, you always got me. Uh, 
Can you just give us that song? Just give me that chorus. Ah. While she's singing that song, I, I want you to just think about the thing that you're suffering for a second. And I just want you to take hold of it. I want you to face it. I want you to feed it. I want you to accept it just for one minute. I don't want us to move to transformation before we take a moment to say, this is the weapon that's been trying to kill me. Just for one minute while she sings that song. Come on. Father, we face it right now. Father, bring it right now. Father, bring it right now. Bring it right now. Bring it right now. worship anytime and we move by the spirit amen so just clap hands for the worship team just as I am thank you Lord that's what I thought you were now you'll come back with that now how many of you know Nick Fuji one in the room two in the room he's that guy with no arms how many of you know him? Yes. This is funny, you don't know the name, but we know the situation. <laughs> He's a guy with no arms, no legs. You see the white guy. Yes. Big smile. Yes. Such a beautiful smile. Yes. Are you watching any of this stuff? Yes. Nick Fuji. It's amazing. He was born with no limbs. No arms, no legs. Talk about transforming your situation. He was born with no limbs. And then he wrote a book called No Limits. Oh, I love that. Amen. He was born with no limbs, but he transformed his situation to the point that he could write a book called No Limits. That his lack of limbs was not going to be a limitation in his life. Amen. What would you do? You I don't remember the last time you thanked God for your hands and your feet. When was the last time you came to all night prayer just to thank God for these hands and these feet? But I tell you now, if something threatened that hand and those feet, you would pray. <laughs> just a hammer. Forget a cancer. Just something to, just something to hit your toe. You can't go, you will start praying, yay! <laughs> First thing, Jesus! <laughs> what would you do with no limbs? He was born in that situation, but he transformed it to the point. I don't know what you were born in. I know you would say, but my situation is hard, my and that's why it's nice to have a model like that. Because none of you here are without limbs. And whatever you're facing, I bet you there's a correlation that we can bring this man. And he's a believer. How easy would it be for you to not trust God if you didn't have limbs? How easy would it be for you to say, is there really a God? Is it? He's, he's a preacher of note. He can't even do the hand that I'm doing right now. He was no arms, no legs. Love him to bits. Please read the book. Life with no limbs. He, <laughs> he was born with no limbs, but he built this ministry and this business as a motivational speaker going all around the world to the point that even you here in South Africa, you know about him. Yeah. His life has impacted millions of people with no limbs. And you and I that have both arms and both legs are still struggling just to affect Bramfontein. Yeah. With both arms and both legs. <laughs> He's running faster than you and I. With no limbs. 
with no limbs, he's married and has children. Oh yes, praise the Lord. That's it, my brother. I laughed too. It was awesome. Because <laughs> he's still got stuff that works. Praise the Lord. Amen. He would laugh about it too. It's a blessing. <laughs> Feel free to laugh. It's okay. With no limbs, he's married and he's got kids. And I just laughed sometimes. I have a friend who's, who was burnt from, from a young age. The whole body was burnt. Her arm is, is gone. And she got married two years ago. Oh, and I, I have to confess this, man. I was like, I have friends right now, even in this church, who are praying for a man, praying for a woman. Right. <laughs> praying! Oh, you're looking at me like I'm talking about somebody else. in this church. Praying, Rabba Shanta, ta 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 for a man praying for a woman. With both limbs. On the floor, hitting the ground. And you can't get a husband, can't get a wife, can't get a child. Hallelujah. In... <laughs> what is limiting you? No limbs. But his life was limitless. He is limitless. Amen? Born with no limbs, I'll give you one more. But a passionate relationship with Jesus. Passionate relationship with God. When you could have said, I don't believe in this God. When you could have been suicidal. And here you are, with both arms and both legs, doubting your Jesus. Doubting your God, wondering whether your God is with you. Can I tell you something? Your God is with you. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something? Your God loves you. Hallelujah. And I don't know how to press it far enough to you that you know it, that whatever you are lacking in your life does not mean that you don't have your God for you, not against you. Hallelujah. He's with you, my friend. I'm wondering. Why is it that perhaps we are more limited? Perhaps these benefits that we have create more limitations. And perhaps that's why sometimes God has to allow a fight. So that you can, only if you're ready to fight, do you go down and find the muscle you need to keep going forward. Because your fight is also your view. Amen? Now, ah, do a couple of things. My time is almost run out. We're going to take hold of it. We have to transform it. You have to take your situation, your lack, your problem, and you have to change it from a weapon into a fire that is fuel for your life. You have to turn it into something. My lack can also be my benefit. My problem can also teach me about my progress. That there's something in it that I can turn around and use it for my benefit. So let me give you three questions to ask yourself maybe as homework. Number one, in your situation currently and maybe with some situations behind the time, uh, or rather in your life, because I can sit on this point all day, praise the Lord. I want you to ask yourself, what lesson can I learn from this situation? What lesson did that problem teach you? Because there's no such thing as failing. Everything is lessons. Amen. And they say no losses, just lessons. Amen. The, the only way you're failing is if you're not learning. What can I learn from that problem? Question number one. Please go sit down today. Because he's trying to teach you how to take hold of it and he's trying to teach you how to transform it so that it can be fuel for your future. Amen. So the very thing that has been trying to pull you down, we want to be, we want miracles to happen. We want transformation. Our vision is transformation. We want to transform that thing so that instead of pulling us down, it launches us to another level. So number one, what can you learn from that situation. Number two, what opportunities do you have because of that situation? I have a friend who moved in with us uh, when COVID started. Young man, 
He's probably 24, 25 years old right now. Uh, he was abandoned as a child. His mother left him on the on the on the front door front door of his uncle's house uh, because she she just she could not handle she could not handle uh, taking care. She didn't have enough money, and so she left him with the uncle, hoping that they'd do something. Uh, it turned out that the family also felt like ah we can't take care of this boy, uh, and so they put him in orphanages. So all his life he's grown up in one orphanage after another orphanage, after another orphanage. He doesn't have a place to stay. So when when we met him, uh, he came to my place. And when we met him, he was homeless at that stage. He had just lost a job. COVID came and he didn't have a place to stay. And we said, no, listen, you can come and stay with us. Since COVID began, he's still with me right now. Right? Now, in that time, he's an actor. In that time, he was trying to look for work. He wasn't getting work. He wasn't getting any work. Kept on, kept on. We would talk, we would pray. He's not a believer. I'm still trying to reach out to him. Please pray for him. Every now and then I bring him in and then he disappears. But God is going to do something in his life. Amen? Because you never give up on your people, amen? amen? He keeps on trying, keeps on trying. And somewhere in the midst of it, he started to discover a gift. I'm asking the question, what opportunities does this situation give you? If I make the point of his life, because maybe you've lost your job, but you know what you have now? You've got time. You've got time to learn something. You've got, time to, you've got time to learn an instrument. <laughs> you've got time to read books. You can use that time to build your life. Just because you don't have a job, doesn't mean you don't have the time to do something. You've got an opportunity in front of you. So here's what he did. He started to learn, he started to work with art. He started to put stuff on his body, started to take weird things. Sometimes I'd find him and he put sellotape all around his body, making weird black and white pictures. You know artists, artists can, any artists in the house, I don't want to offend anybody. Praise the Lord, I love you guys, I'm with you too. <laughs> he would do weird things, just like mummy things, and just his eyes sticking out and blood and da 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 da. But the picture was amazing, it was striking. So he, he, sometimes I'd find buckets of mud and he's just, and I'm like, okay, let's see what I find. So we like it. I, um, I 
some of you know my situation right now. Uh, the stuff is still being moved out of my house, and so they took my clippers and everything. It's crazy. And so I, didn't find, I couldn't find my clippers to cut my hair. So I was like, man, I'm coming to the church. I feel so ungroomed. It's a small thing, but it's like, seriously. I was like, ah, I feel so ungroomed, man. I'm like, ah, I didn't cut my hair. Blah, 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 blah. And you know, me, I'm a bold man. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know. Oh, God. <laughs> So anyway, I was feeling a little bit funny this morning. And then I said, ah, you know what? This is an opportunity for me to grow in my grow in my confidence. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. This is an opportunity for me to present myself just as I am. Yeah. This is an opportunity for me to get people to love me for who I am. Praise the Lord. Julius Bakunzi. Amen. I'm the only one that exists. So you gotta love me just as I am. Amen. And if you're not gonna love me for just as I am, do me a favor and find somebody else. Praise the Lord. Because I'm looking for a people that are gonna be with me just as I am. You gotta give us that song. Amen. Touch it, touch it, touch it, touch it. Now, that's a moment. I'm trying to give you something where you can feel a problem and you can take hold of it. And rather than it being, I could have been insecure, I could have been looking for some place to not go to because of a, what, what somebody might say is a small thing, but for somebody else it's a big thing. For someone here not coming to church with, church with makeup is a big thing. Amen. For someone here not looking is a big thing. And it can limit your life. Mm. But if you learn how to take hold of that thing, you don't know how to transform that thing. Then you will triumph for that thing. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So let me wrap up with this, with this verse and I'll be done. How much did I could? He took it. He takes hold of it. And he says, for the next seven years, what I'm trying to give you is a skill set that is going to benefit you for the next seven years of your life. And seven is a number of perfection. He's not talking about an actual seven. It's a number of completion. He's basically saying, if you learn how to take it, if you learn how to transform it, if you learn how to triumph with it, this thing will bless you for your whole life. It is a skill for your whole life. And if you learn what I'm teaching you right now, you will plunder everyone that came to plunder you. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, you will take up the thing that came to attack you. You will end up attacking it in Jesus' mighty name. Now I want to end off with Jesus. Because we have to end up with Jesus. Amen. Jesus faced a cross as we all know. And on that cross, he was abused. If you've been abused in this house, Jesus, on that cross, was abused. He was beaten. He was innocent. He was abused. The, the most innocent person that ever existed, he was abused by God. He was humiliated. He was embarrassed. He was abandoned. He was all alone. If you've ever been alone, you can relate to where Jesus was. And when they put him on that cross, that cross was used to strike fear in people. Because that cross was used to kill criminals. It was killed. It was used to, 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 to bring shame. But Jesus took that cross. He transformed that cross. And three days later, he triumphed with that cross. The very same cross that came to kill him, God turned it around. <laughs> Amen. So much so that today, 2,000 years ago, when they saw the cross, they were afraid. It was a tool for fear and pain. 2,000 years later, when we see the cross, we see victory. We see hope. We see life. 
Because somebody took the cross, somebody transformed that cross, and somebody triumphed with that cross. Amen? That's what Jesus did. And that's what the Father is saying you need to do. With your situation, maybe you were abused, maybe you've been abandoned, maybe you've been let down, Whatever it is you face today, maybe you've been at a place where you said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Maybe you feel like God has forsaken you. And it's dark. God is saying, don't deny it. Take hold of that thing. Sit with me and transform it. And I'm going to show you how to triumph over it. Because child of God, listen to me, listen to me. Your fight is also your fuel. Hallelujah. Yeah.